can't draft for need. You draft for need, you get fired. Draft the best players. If you got two of them, now you got three of them. And just take the best players that are available for you. Now, if you've got four players right there together and one of them is a need, you're, you're, that's the home run. The home run. That's what the Buckos are looking for with the fifth selection in this 2019 NFL draft. Welcome back to a few extra bucks. We've missed you. I hope you've missed us. I am Mike Neighbors. My producer, Justin Thomas, and my partner, Roy Cummings, will join us in just a second. That was Bruce Arians. We'll hear more from him, of course. First team workouts under Bruce Arians taking place this week right before the NFL draft. And I bring in Roy Cummings. Roy, Bruce Arians, to me, is is really – how could you not like Bruce Arians right now? We may not – you know, Bucks fans may change their opinion after the first couple games, but, boy, he says all the right things in my eyes so far. Well, he does. Uh, yeah, the more uh, we get to know Bruce Arians, uh, not that we didn't really know him before, but the more we get to interact with him almost on a daily basis uh, now that we see how he – you know, he, he starts to feel and talk about some of the Buccaneers players. Yeah, I, I really like him. And look, I really like the pick when they made him the new head coach. Uh, I thought it was absolutely the right way to go. Um, haven't changed my mind on that at all. Uh, you know, I, I hope he's all in for sure. Um, I hope this is not a, a, a quick rebuild attempt, but it may be. But, you know, hey, at the end of the day, you're right. He's saying all the right things. And what I like about the way he says them, is he says them very matter-of-factly, very blunt. He doesn't he doesn't hold anything back. He doesn't BS you. And, uh, you know, you, you got a little bit of it right there in that clip where he says, and we'll hear more throughout the podcast today, but, you know, where he says, hey, uh, you, you can't draft for need. That, that's what gets you fired. You, you get need in your pick, uh, you've hit the home run. So that gives you an idea, you know. I mean, that's, that's how people think around the NFL, and, uh, he's going to bring us a lot more of that uh, over the coming years. Uh, so it's it's a great time to be a Bucks fan, I think, actually. Yeah, you know, Dirk Cutter, uh, his press conferences were, were not confrontational, but sometimes you felt a little tension there a little bit. Bruce Arians uh, just seems relaxed answering every single question. I like a few things he said after his first two pra- pra- practices. He said that, uh, you know, chemistry is overrated. He likes accountability. And in terms of the NFL draft, Let's get it over with, Roy Cummings. What do you think of those remarks? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I, I, here's the thing. Coaches are a little bit on the sidelines during the NFL draft process. They sit in the meetings and listen to some of the questions, but they don't really know the players all that well. Um, they'll do some homework on them for sure, especially the guys that they are really targeting early on in, you know, in the first round. Um, maybe some of the guys that they're looking at in the second and third round. But when you get to the fourth, fifth round guys, they don't know anything about these guys and their coaches. What they want is they want the player on campus with them, ready to work and show me what the kids really got. Because right now they don't, I mean, they're looking at college tape and yeah, that's exciting, but they're saying, how does this really relate to what I, what I'm doing? You know, uh, I need a guy who can play in the NFL and I'll start to find out how good of an NFL player he's going to be as soon as I get him, uh, you know, in my building working with me and my team and we'll see how good he really is. And then we'll put the pads on and really get an indication. So yeah, that's kind of part, you know, where that's coming from. It's kind of like for, for coaches, this is a real tough time because they just don't have a whole lot to do with the draft process. And uh, they're, they're just anxious to get these guys in, you know, in the building and get to working with them. Justin Thomas, our esteemed producer, you've been uh, pulling down a lot of Bruce Arians. Now we're going to hear from Jameis Winston in a bit too. I know it's uh, only April, but it's good to hear some football again, isn't it? I was going to say the draft is the first for me, real sign that the season is about, you know, to start up. No doubt about it. Let's hear from Bruce Arians on are he and Jason light really ready for this NFL draft? Oh, totally. About three weeks ago, we were totally prepared, I think. And going over and over and over, Jason and I have massaged that thing so many times, it's, it's got fingerprints all over it, you know? It, uh, no, we're, we're more than ready. A little massage in Roy Cummings. Man, Bruce Arians, media, media gold mine. if you cover this guy. Let's talk about the draft, how it's lined up. It looked like Kyler Murray was going to go number one even a week ago. Everybody was saying 99% sure. Now it looks like it's not going to happen at all. Boy, Kyler Murray, if he would have gone number one, and maybe he will be, but the chances don't look as good. If he goes number one, that's really going to help the Bucs. 
It really is. And that's what uh, Bucks fans should really be hoping for is that uh, Kyler Murray definitely goes number one. Or if he doesn't go number one, you know, maybe somebody trades up into that into a spot somewhere in the top four uh, to get him. Uh, you wouldn't mind seeing that happen because anything, any combination of Kyler Murray involved in the first four picks of the draft uh, pushes one of the elite defenders in this draft down to the Bucks and gives them just a little bit more of an opportunity to a get a better, you know, the best player possible. Uh, B possibly trade out of their spot down a couple of more spots if they can still. Uh, if they believe they can do that and still get the player they want. So, um, you know, anything that pushes those elite defensive players uh, closer to them, gives them a little bit more of a, uh, a group to choose from is certainly good for the Buccaneers because, you know, they, they really need everything that's involved in those, that first group of five uh, elite defenders, uh, be it a linebacker, an edge rusher, a defensive uh, tackle. Uh, they, they could use all those pieces and uh, having the opportunity to kind of pick and choose and get the one you like most as opposed to the second or third guy on your list, uh, any, any uh, opportunity to get Kyler Murray in the top four gives them more of a chance to do that. So uh, really good stuff there if, they get, if Kyler Murray goes. So they're, they're sure pull, pulling for that. You know that. Yeah, Roy, you know, on our past A Few Extra Bucks podcast, when we knew what the draft position was going to be for the Bucks, you know, we talked about, you know, will they trade it? We kind of speculated on that after the season. And you said, you know what, when you have the number five pick, you don't want to give up that type of player. I mean, usually in drafts, the talent may taper off at maybe the 12th or 13th pick. But if you're picking number five, that's kind of hard to unload that pick. Yeah, it is. Um, you, you know, if so, again, I don't know that there's anything in this draft that people want so badly that they're going to move up. But the Bucks would gladly move down if they, again, if they know that they're going to get, if they've got four or five guys um, evenly uh, distributed and, and graded, uh, and they think, okay, we can move down to eight or nine and still get one of those guys, they'll, they'll entertain it. I mean, it's what Jason Light likes to do. But um, I just think, I get the feeling it's going to be hard for them, yeah, to move out of number five. I think they're more likely to stand pat, and I, and I believe they should. I think it's a smarter move to just stand pat, take the fifth best player as opposed to the eighth or ninth or tenth best player in the draft, and, uh, you know, hope, hope you can turn them into an all-pro. You know, I respect a lot of guys who have covered the whole process from the senior bowl to the combine, really on the inside. and have uh, heard from the coaches and really talked to these players. And Lewis Riddick is one of those guys. This is kind of an interesting angle for me. You know, last year the flavor was Derwin James. The Bucks are definitely going to get Derwin James, and then they don't pick him. They trade down to get Vita Vea. This time it's Devin White. Oh, they're going to get Devin White, Devin White. Well, Lewis Riddick says maybe the most athletic player in this draft is Devin Bush, of course, a player you know, similar to Devin White in a lot of ways. Now, what if the Bucks feel like they can get Devin White and give up some picks? I mean, you know, to me, that's kind of an interesting thing to watch in this draft because everybody's saying Devin White. Devin Bush could be a guy to kind of enter the conversation potentially. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I've seen a couple of mock drafts where Devin White is still there around number nine or ten. So that's a scenario that makes some sense. I mean, look, I, I'm a Devin White guy. I like him. I think the Bucks have a real tough decision to make if, if it's Devin White, uh, Ed Oliver and Josh Allen sitting there at number five. I think all of a sudden they've got to they're, they're looking at each other and saying, "Okay, now what do we do?" But um, and maybe that's a spot where you where you do offer uh, or take up take somebody up on an offer to move down a little bit. Um, but you're right. Yeah, if Devin Bush is the best athlete, you know the thing we don't know is how do the Buccaneers rate these guys? We've seen, uh, you know, take take your pick of mock drafters, uh, whether you like. Uh, you know, ESPN's people or, or NFL networks, you know, Daniel Jeremiah, whoever it may be, take your pick of those people in their rankings. Um, but we don't know what the Buccaneers rankings are. And, you know, those are the rankings that matter the most. Uh, you may not believe in them as much as you like the other guys, but you know, these are the guys who are truly paid to do this stuff. And uh, so, so what we don't know is where do the Bucks rank, rank these guys last year, uh, you're right. A lot of people thought that uh, Derwin James was uh, was going to be the pick. Uh, turns out that the Bucks really uh, didn't didn't believe in him as much as other people did. And uh, you know whether that was right or wrong, we'll we'll see. But um, you know it's the same this year. Uh, we'll find out you know tomorrow uh, just where the Buccaneers, how the Buccaneers feel about all these guys, because at some point uh, 
the answer is going to be they're at number five or lower. And if they pass on a Devin White, pass on a Josh Allen, pass on an Ed Oliver, whoever it may be, that's going to tell us that uh, they didn't like that guy as much as we thought. The tale of two Devins, Devin White or Devin Bush, both could potentially be Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, it's very interesting. I always feel <laughs> old so many ways in your life when you get older. But I remember Devin Bush's dad at Florida State, and uh, you know I remember covering him at Florida State. That was his dad. And, of course, he wasn't as big as his son. Devin Bush, more of a linebacker. His dad was in the secondary. But it's a circle of life, man. It's crazy how it works. Well, let's go. Let's stay on the defensive side of the football and talk about the elephant in the room for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Gerald McCoy, not at off-season workouts this week, which, of course, is unusual for him. Here's what Bruce Arians had to say about the absent Gerald McCoy. It's up to him. I mean, he, he, we got open arms. You know, if he wants to be here in practice with us, that's great. And uh, he, he's under contract and part of the team. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a player's decision. And that's all I can do. Now, the reports have been all over the place with Gerald McCoy since the Bucs season ended. Uh, you know, local reports had him definitely coming back, and then it looks like he's definitely not coming back. I heard former Bucks general manager Mark Dominic say on local radio he thinks he is coming back. Is Gerald McCoy coming back, Roy? What do you think? I do think he – well, I think he should come back. Um, if I'm the Buccaneers, I'm not letting him go. I'm not giving him up for a third-round draft pick. I'm sorry. I'm just not doing it. Um, not yet. Uh, maybe next year – if you can get that, uh, and if it falls to a fourth-round pick next year because he, he didn't have a great season. I just feel that if the Buccaneers are trying to be contenders this year, and I don't know why they wouldn't be, uh, I think Gerald McCoy helps them do that. I, I honestly believe that no matter who you get, even if you get Quinn and Williams, he will not be better than Gerald McCoy this year. Um, maybe over the course of the next five to ten years, he will be. But right now, if you're trying to contend and get out of this 5-11, and 6-10 and 10 rut that the Buccaneers are in, you need Gerald McCoy. Um, and, uh, and, and I think they're gonna, I think that's how they see it, too. The $13 million is an issue, but I think there's ways to work around that. Uh, I think Gerald McCoy is a little bit hurt um, because of some of the things that have been said about him by the team where they haven't shown a, a great commitment to him. Um, they probably have let him know that they, you know, they are listening you know, willing to listen to offers that, that he may not be a part of this team, but uh, we're kind of, you know, running out of time here for them to get much out of, uh, out of him for this draft. And if they can't get uh, at least a third round pick in this draft for Gerald McCoy, I, I don't move Gerald McCoy. So, and, and again, as time, you know, with each passing minute, uh, I think it looks more and more like Gerald McCoy is going to be here. And I think that's good for the Buccaneers. So that's where I stand. Well, if Gerald McCoy is trade bait, which he obviously is, then why would Bruce Arians, I said at the top that Bruce Arians has said all the right things. I think the one wrong thing he has said is that he's not as a disruptive player as he used to be. Now, why do you say that on so many levels? A, he's a respected leader on this team. And B, if you want to trade the guy, you don't want to say anything bad about him, do you? I mean, come on. No, but I, to me, that was an indication that, again, that's Bruce Arians being honest. And I think that was also an indication at the time of, well, look, we're not really looking to move this guy. I mean, if somebody wants him badly enough, you know, we'll we'll certainly listen. And I think that's where the Bucks really are. I I, I think, but you know, again, at the same time, maybe uh, maybe they haven't. Maybe they, you know, and for some reason, it, there there's a bit of a disconnect right now between Gerald McCoy and the Buccaneers. Um, it could be that they've let him know that that if somebody wants you, we're we're gonna you know listen to it. We've got to considering the contract and everything else. It could be that. Gerald McCoy is staying away until his contract is restructured. There, there could be something going on behind the scenes that we don't know. I don't think Gerald McCoy is going to play for anybody for $13 million this year, uh, including the Buccaneers. So that could be a part of it as well. But, um, again, I, I just think that – but he's right. I mean, Bruce Arians is right. Gerald McCoy is not, is not as disruptive now as he has been in the past. I think that's evident. But a completely healthy Gerald McCoy may be – and um, I think the Bucks would like to see that. And, uh, you know, I'm anxious to see it, too. Um, but I don't know that how, how many other people are going to be much more disruptive than he is at this point. Uh, I still think he's a darn good player. So um, uh, I still think he's going to be a part of this team. 
Sorry, Bruce Arians, I'm being the ultimate media hypocrite. Uh, you're being honest, and I'm questioning you on being honest because maybe you shouldn't be honest because that would help you with trade value. But uh, just kind of throwing that out there. Let's go to the offensive side of the football. Jameis Winston, boy, no excuses for Jameis now. He's got a coach in his corner, no Deshaun Jackson, chirping in the huddle, and no Ryan Fitzpatrick looking over his shoulder. He looked loose at this week's press conference. Seems to uh, be acclimating himself to the system. It helps when Byron Leftwich is in his ear, who's used to it. You have Blaine Gabbard as a backup, who's not going to threaten him in terms of playing time, but can give him pointers with the system. Here's Jameis Winston on learning the new system of Bruce Arians. One of the best things uh, about this system is they, they kind of structure it to the quarterback strengths. You know, so uh, I know we're going to be put in the best situation possible, uh, and it's going to be our, it's our, our job to go out there and execute it. All right, Roy. Uh, Jameis has every right to feel loose, but does he have to be feeling pressure a little bit? Because, boy, if he doesn't perform this year, he can't blame anybody. You know, I don't know that Jameis Winston feels that much pressure. And here's why. Um, number one, I, I think he's had a chance here this year uh, to, to kind of hit the refresh button. And I think that's good for him. Um, yes, it's, an, it's another coach who's in his corner. Uh, it's a new system. Uh, he's got some NFL experience, a lot of it right now. He's done some very good things. Uh, I think he knows exactly what he's got to do to be better. Um, I think the opportunity to hit the refresh button for him with Bruce Arians and Byron Leftwich uh, uh, producing the, the offense for him, I, th I think he's excited about it. Uh, that's number one. In terms of pressure, he's a very confident kid. I think he also knows that if things don't work out here in Tampa Bay this year, Come next year, there will be eight teams or a dozen teams that want that want him on their football team, and he'll gladly go somewhere else. That if these guys don't want me, I'll go somewhere else, and I'm good enough, and I'll be a starter, and I'll show them, I'll show everybody there that I can be that player. I think he's that confident uh, in his ability. I think he's confident in how much he's learning, how quickly he's developing, and um, you know, again, the system he's in is prone to errors. When you're throwing the ball downfield, not just dumping it off all the time, you're going to be more susceptible to mistakes and interceptions. Uh, he understands that. Uh, Bruce Arians understands that. Um, I think he's excited to have a new uh, coach in his ear, uh, just kind of start over, get to hit the refresh button, and I think he's going uh, to excel because of it. But don't you think Jameis Winston is that kind of guy – that wants to make it right with this franchise. I mean, he was the number one overall pick. He kind of let him down. You know, he, he wants to, I, to me, he's one of those pleasers too. He wants to please you. He does it. He does. He wants to make it right with this franchise. I got to feel like he's, he has that on his brain. Oh, you're absolutely right about that. There's no doubt. Yeah. Deep down inside, he wants to do uh, the best he can for these guys. But I think he also knows how not to put too much pressure on himself for that. Um, yes, that's, that's his goal. That's his objective. He wants to make the Buccaneers proud. He wants to make his fans proud and happy. He wants to make his family proud and happy. He carries all that. But I don't think he lets that affect him uh, in terms of how he plays on the field on game day. I don't think he lets that, um, that pressure get to him uh, in, in the moment. I think it's one of his strengths, really, and why at the end of the day I think he's going to be very good uh, as soon as he figures a few more things out here in the NFL. Uh, look, uh, I've been a big fan of his since he came here. Um, I, I continue to see progress every time he hits the field. Um, yeah. I think a, a healthy uh, uh, Jameis Winston is going to be really good for the Buccaneers this year, and I think he's going to surprise a lot of people. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think he feels a lot of pressure, especially with uh, the extra money with the fifth year. That kind of helps out his too. Well, speaking of pressure – it's been a little while, guys, but Justin, you know what time it is. More likely, baby, three questions, three hypotheticals with myself, with Justin Thomas, and with Roy Cummings. And we've kind of established a pattern because we've been doing this for a while on a few extra bucks podcast here on pewterpirates.com. We're going to let Justin go first. Because sometimes he reads off of Roy's paper a little <laughs> bit. So we're going to let Justin go first. Um, all right, point blank, guys. It's NFL draft week. Justin, more likely, who are the Bucks going to pick at number five? 
I, y'all both raised great points about whether or not Kyler Murphy, if he's drafted by Arizona or not, how that's going to affect. Um, I think Devin White is a great fit for the Bucks, so I'm going to go with what I hope will happen, and that is Devin White going to the Bucks. Roy, I think you're going to concur. I was, but I'm starting to Uh-oh. see more mock drafts that have the Buccaneers uh, that give the Buccaneers an opportunity to choose between Devin White and Josh Allen. And I'm not so sure it's going to happen, but I'm going to follow the mocks and I'm going to say they take Josh Allen because, wow. look, I, I th- he played in the SEC. Uh, obviously, yeah. Devin, so did Devin White. But I just think that Josh Allen – has an opportunity to be a little bit more versatile. And I think that fits a little bit more what the Buccaneers are looking for uh, in a defender right now. This is a guy that can move around a little bit. He's a bit of a hybrid. Um, I think that kind of fits what the Buccaneers are looking to do more than just a guy who's a positional player. Uh, and, and so I think that that's going to help him a lot. So I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian here. And I'm going to say they pass on Devin white and take Josh Allen, assuming he's available. Um, yeah, I'm with you. You know, it's easy to say Devin White. Like last year, it was easy to say Derwin James. That was a chic pick. I'm going to go off the board, too, because I want to look like a genius if I'm right, Roy. Often I'm not a genius, very rarely. How about Ed Oliver? Uh, he's kind of a chic guy to go early. He's one of those guys that you maybe fall in love with him a little bit. How about Ed Oliver potentially right there? Well, I like the idea, but I'm hearing some some really shaky things about Ed Oliver, and you know, I'm hearing some talk that this is a guy who who may not uh, be able to back up the the trash talk that he throws out there every afternoon. Um, I'm starting to see his name uh, drop in some uh, mock drafts. I'm seeing him, you know, very high in others, of course. But you know, I, I don't know that I would have a problem with that pick. But I'm also hearing some things that make me wonder if, you know, character wise. Is this the guy you really want? Um, it might be one of those guys where you say, you know what? I think he's a great. I think he's going to be a great player, but I'm not so sure he's going to fit what we want here. So, um, wouldn't necessarily have a problem with it. But to me, there's a bit of a red flag in the character, and I don't think you want to screw it up with the with the fifth overall pick. So I don't know. We'll see. But I, I wouldn't argue with it. Yeah, he's a definite top 10 pick. We don't know top five pick, but I think, you know, if they go on a run with defensive linemen like we think they're going to run, if Kyler Murray isn't picked number one overall, they may think, you know what, let's get Ned Oliver, kind of compliment ourselves with Vita Vea, and we can get that linebacker later. But uh, Devin White really, to me, is the odds on favorite, but I like going a little contrarian and more likely just because we can. All right, our second more likely when you talk about draft busts over the years, I think it's almost consensus, guys, that these two guys are the biggest busts in draft history. Ryan Leaf and Jamarcus Russell. More likely, though, I'll begin with Justin. Who's the bigger bust? And who's the biggest bust in draft history, Ryan Leaf or Jamarcus Russell? Are you asking me who's the biggest bust in NFL history out of those two or – out of, the, out of these okay. two, yes, because they're kind of the consensus one, too, in a lot of no, ways. No, I agree with you. Um, that's really tough. Uh, I kind of want to say Jamarcus Russell. I mean, the amount of talent athletically that he had, I still remember him doing the kneel and throwing the ball almost all the way across the field was insane to see. Yeah. Um, I think there was so much hype surrounding him, I remember, and then – You know, you hear the stories after when he kind of failed about how the team gave him the disc of plays to look at, and he's there was nothing on there, and he said, "Oh yeah, coach, I watched them all." So, you know, it's just really sad to see. I think you know he didn't put in the effort that he should have, and if he did, he would have been a great player. But for whatever reason, he really struggled and didn't want to put in the work. And to me, that's almost you know worse than Ryan Leaf in a way. So I'm going to go with him, Jamarcus Russell. Well, once upon a time, Ryan Leaf was a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, and Roy Cummings remembers this. And that was one of my uh, most enjoyable training camp moments is when, to the chagrin of the, the Bucks PR staff, Leaf was there and could have been a nicer guy, really. 
and you heard all these things coming in and seemed to be open-minded about, you know, a fresh start. And I asked him, I said, can we kind of reenact that whole thing when you yelled at the reporter in San Diego? <laughs> and, and the Bucks PR guys freaked out on me. And it was when they trained at the University of Tampa. And I said, we won't do it here. We'll go upstairs and do it. And he did it. And it was great. And he yelled at me. He goes, knock it off. And then he hugged me. He's like, I'm just kidding. I love this guy. And I appreciated that. But Roy, you remember Ryan Leaf back in the day. What was the bigger bus, Ryan Leaf or Jamarcus Russell? You know, I think it was uh... – I'm, I'm going to say Ryan Leaf because, look, I always felt with Jamarcus Russell that everybody kind of fell in love with him at the end of the college season, or as that as that 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 previous college season, um, his 2006 uh, season, I guess it was. Everybody kind of fell in love with him all of a sudden. He, he was a, he was a he was a good prospect. Everybody was looking at him and saying, "Yeah, he's got great size, great ability. Uh, you know, he's got a, seems to have everything you want." and and just as time grew on, uh, he just became the, the face of that 2007 NFL draft. And, and I never bought into it. I, I just I, I always thought that, are you, are you people serious? I mean, you know, you got to look a little bit deeper. I mean, this guy had, a, you know, he had a nice college career. And, you know, but it just seems like he kind of just came out of nowhere almost. And everybody fell in love with him. Obviously, the Raiders fell in love with him. Whereas Ryan Lee, there was a there was a you know, question all the way right up until draft day, who's better, him or Peyton Manning? I mean, there was, there was really uh, a lot of question, like, who one do you, which one do you want? And there were some people who were adamant that Ryan Leaf was the better player. I think there was a lot more homework, better homework, actually, done on Ryan Leaf, and it just never happened. And Whereas I think Jamarcus Russell, to me, I, I would have had buyer's remorse right away. To me, it was buyer, there was a buyer beware tag on Jamarcus Russell from the very beginning. I just thought everybody fell in love with him way too easily and almost made him the first round pick in that draft, whereas it wasn't necessary. He didn't really earn that spot. Whereas Ryan Leaf had, you know, he was the second overall pick behind Peyton Manning. Had he gone first overall, I don't think anybody would have argued. I, I certainly didn't argue. And I don't think anybody else argued at the time that he was deserving of the number two overall pick. It just didn't work out. So I thought more homework was done with Ryan Leaf. Um, I think uh, there was a little bit of a of a reach with Jamarcus Russell, and therefore uh, I wasn't as surprised with him being the bust. I think you, you, you could almost, if you looked hard enough, you could see it coming, and maybe you didn't need to look that hard. Whereas with Ryan Leaf, I don't think anybody saw that coming. Great points, Roy Cummings. Uh, you know, you look at it, you could say Jamarcus is worse because he was number one overall. Ryan Leaf was two. They both only played three years, which is amazing. Uh, Ryan Leaf only had 14 touchdown passes, 36 interceptions. Jamarcus Russell, 18 touchdowns, 23 interceptions. It, it's brutal all around. But I agree with you. I think Ryan Leaf is worse because I think if Ryan Leaf would have had his head on straight, he would have been a good quarterback in the NFL. He had everything going for him. But, man, you know what? That's what the, the dilemma is in the NFL draft. You don't know where these guys' heads are. They can say all the right things. They can have great pro days. They can have great workouts. But then you run into a buzzsaw once you turn on the bright lights for real. All right, more likely number three, we always do a little pop culture. And you guys busted my chops that Elton John was better than Billy Joel, which I still can't believe. That was a, many podcasts ago. Well, I'm going to reset this a little bit. First, you got the Elton John movie coming out in, uh, in about a month, kind of like Bohemian Rhapsody. Alex actually looked pretty good. I want to see that. But I'm going to replace Elton John. Okay, Elton John's concert was canceled in Tampa, rescheduled for November. But I'm going to replace Billy Joel with this guy. More likely, who do you like better? This guy's going to be in Tampa in September. You have Elton John or you have Phil Collins. More likely, who would you pick, Justin Thomas? Oh, um, I'm going to still stick with Elton John. I, I like Phil Collins. I've, I mean, not only did he have great success with Genesis, but his, as a solo artist, but, uh, I don't know. Phil Collins is kind of sad and mopey to me, whereas Elton John seems <laughs> to have more fun. So <laughs> I'd rather see Elton John live. This is what I love about Roy. I have no idea what he's going to say. Like, he, he throws me curveballs all the time. But more likely, Roy, uh, if you had a ticket for you and your wife, two tickets, you could see Elton John or, or Phil Collins, who would it be? I'm going to answer this question this way. Um, if the question were, 
Billy Joel or Phil Collins. I would take Billy Joel, even though I think he's overrated, <laughs> just as much as Phil Collins is overrated. <laughs> How's that for an answer? What if, you you th- know what? what if you threw in Genesis, though, all the Genesis songs? Can't do it. Can't do it. That Sorry. doesn't count? Can't do it. Just can't do it. Okay. I'll take I'll take Elton John over all of them combined. You could have <laughs> Phil Collins and Billy Joel together on the same bill. I don't know who'd open for the other, but yeah. oh, Phil Collins is open. Collins would have to open for Billy Joel, but I would. There's no question. I, I would still, you know, and I'd still go to see Elton John all by himself. Even if Elton John was just doing one song, I would probably go see him. I'm not a Phil Collins fan. Um, Here's some trivia for you, though. I knew you wouldn't well, disappoint. Everybody I knew knows you would. Because if you know Phil Collins or if you like Phil Collins, you probably know this. Um, he was actually in A Hard Day's Night. Really? So you get a glimpse of him very briefly, and you, you kind of have to look at uh, some of the documentaries on the film to find him. Um, but he's very br- he's in the concert scene in the audience. Really? And. Yeah, he's dressed up. He's got his little suit on, little Lord Fauntleroy suit or whatever. And he's actually in the in the movie. He's on he's on screen uh, during one of the shots of the crowd, and um, you get a brief glimpse of him. He was actually in the movie A Hard Day's Night. Um, I think his career went down from there. To be honest, um, you know he was like six at the time or ten, but uh, I think his career went down from there. But uh, hey, it's a good way to start. So if Phil Collins was opening up for Billy Joel, you'd still you'd see Los Lobos and and Elton John over that. Yeah, uh, you're right for sure, no question. <laughs> I actually saw Los I actually saw Los Lobos open for U2 at the old Sombrero. Yeah, now that, now that's day. a good show. Yeah, good yeah. Show. Part of it, part of it was. You know, I, I if they, if he throws Genesis in there, it's tough because I love Genesis. I was going to ask, what about uh, Peter Gabriel? Uh, that would be tough Ooh. for me to choose. He's even more Whisper overrated now, than, than Phil. Oh, oh, no. All right. Now we're going to have to sorry. disagree. I'm sorry. It's a sledgehammer is not a good song. I don't know that Peter Gabriel did anything. Uh, good oh, as well. man. Those are fight words now. All right. All right. Let me. Here, all right, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Okay. Way back in the MTV era, when Peter Gabriel and Genesis were hot, or maybe whatever. There was a there was like a 50th anniversary of um, uh, the uh, what the heck's the show uh, American Bandstand right and mm-hmm. the guy from American Bandstand I'm blanking out on his name right now Dick but Clark the guy who hosted Dick Clark hosted it for all those years now they, they they did this thing with a bunch of current artists at the time okay so again this is the MTV era this is the mid to late 80s right early 90s and he's got the Thompson Twins on right. And he's wow. and they're getting ready to they're getting ready to do a segment, and in this special, this like three hour special, this uh, tribute to to American Bandstand, and they're getting ready to set up something uh, that they were going to do, and the setup was Dick Clark interviewing the Thompson Twins and asking them, of all the great bands in, in the history of rock and roll, who was the greatest live artist? Who would you? Who would you want to see live? You can see one band or artist live. Who would you want to see? And he turns the microphone over to one of the Thompson twins, and the guy goes, oh, Peter Gabriel, without any question, Peter Gabriel. (laughs) And it looked as if, I mean, Dick Clark looked as if somebody just shot him between the eyes. He looked at the camera as if to say, are you friggin' kidding me? And he goes, and he and he had to he had to talk his way out of it. He goes, really, no Elvis, no Beatles, no, you know, James Brown, perhaps. And they go, oh no, Peter Gabriel, he's incredibly live, and all this other stuff. And he goes, and and what they were they, literally they were setting up a James Brown segment about how great James <laughs> Brown is live, and um, but they they thought Peter Gabriel. So you know, I guess maybe Peter Gabriel is something special live, but. Uh, I'll pass. I'll go see Elton John because you know what? He's pretty good live too. But don't hate on Peter Gabriel just because the Thompson twins are idiots. Oh, no. I hate on Peter Gabriel because they think his music <laughs> sucks. Oh, it's honest. No. It's an honest uh, dislike. Then. Oh, my God. Oh, oh. No. I'm just, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm with Dick Clark. Don't give me any of this Peter Gabriel crap. Wow. You know, I, I will say this. Uh, I'm going to throw out one other name. And I like this guy, but man, he is an angry SOB. And not a happy man is John 
Mellencamp. My God, that guy is a miserable human being. And you know what, John? You've had a great life. Why don't you just enjoy yourself, buddy? That's a miserable guy. Just throwing it out. I didn't know he was miserable, but I would still see him over Peter Gabriel and Genesis and Phil Collins uh, and Billy Joel. But I didn't know he was so so miserable. Oh, yeah. YouTube some uh, interviews with John Mellencamp. He's just not a happy fella. Uh, John Mellencamp or Elton John? Uh, still Elton John. God, Elton John's tough. Man. I, I think I think that well, he's I, you know he's great. They have, look, they haven't made a movie about Peter Gabriel or or <laughs> not yet, <laughs> or Billy Joel or any of these others yet. So yeah, the yeah. movie about John Mellencamp will be angry. That's what the the title will be called. Maybe the question should be the next question. Next time we do this, all right, the question probably should be, and we'll have time to think about this: Queen or Elton John. Okay. Oh. See, that is what you call. They both had movies made that's about him. That's why Roy Cummings is the ultimate uh, professional, because that is the ultimate tease for our, our next a few extra bucks, which has gone off the rails. We talked about the bucks, and then we talked about Elton John for about 30 minutes. So, <laughs> But that's what we do. That's why, that's why hopefully you like it, because we give you a little variety. Well, listen, um, check us out. We're on uh, Podbean. We're on iTunes. What else are we on, Justin? Spotify, Google Podcast, uh, Stitcher. Okay. Well, let's right, right next to right next to uh, Billy Joel on all those. By the that's way, that's right, Roy. If you go on iTunes, you could download some Peter Gabriel for your next run. Yeah. Maybe you could do Big Time or something like that. Get you fired up <laughs> for your next run. But that wraps up another a few extra bucks. Uh, you know, always entertaining. Uh, keep it on pewterpires.com. Roy and I are going to have a video recap of whom the Bucks pick at number five and kind of what we think. And then we'll have another podcast reviewing the draft next week. But we appreciate our loyal subscribers. Thanks for listening. Please spread the word for Justin Thomas, our esteemed producer, for my partner, Roy Cummings, and president of the Elton John Fan Club. I am Mike Neighbors. We hope you enjoy the draft, and we'll talk to you soon.